So rise up for worship.
If you are joining us in person or online, we welcome you. Let us greet our neighbors, people next to you or behind you, with the passing of God's peace. Peace be with you. One of our goals this year is to come back, for everyone to come back to in-person worship. So we are serving lunch today, so please uh, join us for fellowship afterwards and have a nice Brazilian meal. So those of you that are online, you're missing a great, fantastic meal. And we will be serving lunch for the, for the next month or so, so you know, we're trying to promote everyone to come back to service, in-person service. Contribution letters for 2021, if you have not received them, please email me or see me afterwards and just tell me that, give me an email address and I'll, I'll be sure to forward it as soon as possible. Revised RCC mask policy. The details are in the bulletin, but as we all, all can see, you know, it's optional now. So, if, but if you do have symptoms, we, we advise please to wear your mask. Uh, Wednesday prayer meeting is a Zoom at 8.30 to 9.30, led by Pastor Sean. Pre-service worship is at 1045 in the small room next to us here. Uh, please see Amos or just stop by to have a, say a prayer before worship. Or you can sit in the sanctuary as well too. Attendance, uh, please fill out the Google. If you're here in person, they do take attendance here. So only for people online or if you're watching online, please uh, um, fill out the Google Sheets to, to record your attendance. Um, offering a tithe, so your sacrifice you're giving helps to keep the operations going. So we thank you for your offerings and tithes. And one announcement that's not on the bulletin, to save the date, it's RCC beautification date. That's Saturday, April 23rd at 10 a.m. We'll have a spring cleaning and a spring planting for outside. So keep, save the date, so, uh, April 23rd. Okay, if you could all just join me in prayer. Father God, we praise you, we worship you, and we come to you in love and admiration. Thank you, Lord, that in worship, we can put aside the uncertainties of this world and rest upon the certainties of your kingdom, for your promises are unchangeable. Father God, we ask you to renew a right spirit within us, that the spirit of Christ arise in all areas of our lives. Lord, create in us a clean and contrite heart, repentance of all our sinful ways. Lord, forgive us for all our wrongdoing. Teach us to seek your holiness and to turn away from our worldliness. Give us passion for discipleship and make true discipleship lead to evangelism. We pray for the people of Ukraine and Russia, for their countries and leaders. We pray for peace and a quick end to the fighting. We pray for all those who are afraid and lost and that your everlasting arms holds them in this time of great fear and uncertainty. We pray for our Ukraine missionary, Vitaly Simolin, for his safety and cover him with your sheltering grace as he serves your people. Father God, we pray for Pastor Joe during his time away. We pray for healing, reconciliation, and restore the joy in his family. Fill them with your grace and restoration. We thank you for bringing Pastor Clayton to worship with us. Give him boldness to, and confidence to speak your words and help them to be clear to us. Bless his ministry in preparing the next generation of leaders. We thank you for all the tithes, offerings, and abundant blessings you provide us. Use it to further your kingdom. Help us to always give cheerfully and our very best. Thank you for our families, our friends, our health, our homes, our work, and our church. Thank you, God, for giving us another day and another chance to become better individuals and another chance to give and experience your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, Pastor Clayton is our, our preacher today. Uh, he grew up in the suburbs of Massachusetts and graduated from University of Massachusetts with a double major in economics and religion and completed his Master's in Divinity at Princeton Theological Seminary in 2011. Pastor Clayton is the pastor of early marriage ministry at Metro Church, walking alongside married couples as they begin their journeys together. He's an avid Patriots fan, and he loves cheering for the, for the team and playing basketball. He equally enjoys curling up on the couch and watching his favorite chick flicks. He wrote that. <laughs> Pastor Clayton is married to Esther and has two sons, Weston and Wyatt. Let's welcome Pastor Clayton. Good morning, Riverside Community Church. 
Uh, just as John had mentioned, uh, my name is Clayton. Uh, I am a pastor at Metro Community Church in Englewood, New Jersey. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Um, for me, this is always like a reminder just how great and grand the Church of God is. Right? I, oftentimes, I think we can divide ourselves in our local churches. But for me, to come to your church today and just to be able to share God's word, uh, it's just a reminder of how great and grand his church is. And I'm also really excited because when I checked out your website, uh, I found out that Sean Hong, you know, Pastor Sean, uh, is the youth pastor here. And so I've known Sean for a long time, uh, even before we were both in ministry. So it's really exciting for me to be here and to, you know, be part of uh, his church, right, the church that, he ha- that you guys are part of. Uh, and so if we could just begin, I just want to begin with a word of prayer. So if you would just bow your heads with me. And I feel like God right now is just telling all of us to be still. To be still and know that I am God. So if we could just take a moment just to be still before him. And just to listen, to hear his voice. God, I thank you for this time that we can come before you in worship to praise you, to exalt you, because you deserve all of the praise. And so I pray, God, for just a fresh anointing to fall in this place. I pray that your spirit would be powerful in this room, in this church, in every ministry that is going on right now. I pray, Father, that we would have a true, powerful encounter with you because we know, Father, that it's not about us seeking after you, but it's always been about you pursuing after us. And so I thank you, God, for just this moment. I pray that it would be a holy moment where we would be able to see your face, to hear your voice, and to experience your power, your grace, and your mercy in our lives. And so would you bless this time right now, God? Would you bless this time, God? We thank you and we pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So just a little bit about me. It's a little weird to hear a bio being read about me. Uh, It's weird to sort of see my life in that lens. But yes, uh, my name is Clayton. I am a pastor uh, at Metro Community Church. Um, and I am a huge Patriots, Celtics, Red Sox fan, and I know that's not popular to say in this area, Uh, especially if you are a Yankees fan or a Knicks fan or even a Giants fan. Um, I don't really worry about the Mets and Jets because they haven't really had anything to cheer for for a while. But I say that with reluctance because I know that is not a popular view in this place. And but I have come around, and New Jersey has grown on me. This is the place where I've, I've met my wife. This is also the place where my kids were born. And so I have a beautiful wife. Her name is Esther. We've been married for six years. Um, the picture is of actually my youngest son's tour, his first birthday. I have two sons, uh, Weston and Wyatt. So Weston is three years old. Wyatt is one years old. And... So if you really think about it, I'm really in the thick of things, right? I have two young children. And not only that, for a lot of you, you know that um, the pandemic hasn't been easy. And for parents, the pandemic has been extra hard. And so I'm really in the thick of things. um, But I've loved every single moment of it. I've loved being a father to two young ones. Uh, I've loved every part of it, even the parts that frustrate me or the times where they frustrate me. Uh, There was a period of time where my oldest, Weston, uh, who is three, A little after he turned two and a half, uh, between two and three, he learned to say the word no. Those are the parents' worst fears. Because it's been amazing just to be able to communicate and to reason with them. But he says no all the time. And it's been really frustrating. It's been really annoying as a parent just to hear those words. Because you want him to do things. You want him to, to be careful. And all he says is no. But here's my secret for dealing with defiant children. If you have children, whether they're young or old, uh, whether you desire to be a parent later on, the secret, for my secret to dealing with defiant children is you take away the thing that they love most and they'll listen to you. And for my son, it's this Captain America costume, right? He loves Marvel. I don't even know why he loves Marvel. He's never seen a movie, 
but he loves dressing up like Captain America. This was his Halloween costume. And even though it's been months since Halloween has passed, he still wears this costume. At every opportunity, every moment, he tries to wear it. And so my wife and I, we've leveraged this love for his costume to really getting him to listen to us. Whenever we ask Wes to brush his teeth or to get ready for bed and he says no, we just say, oh, we're going to throw away Captain America. Immediately, his, answer, his, his response is, okay, I'll do it. Right? It was so bad that during the time of Halloween, during that season, um, we used to leverage this love for, our, for his Captain America so much that it didn't even matter if he listened or obeyed us. Right? The moment we made a move towards our bedroom where we are storing the costume, immediately he's like, don't throw away Captain America. He was scared that we were going to take his love away. Any sudden movement towards that direction caused him to react. Now, if you are a parent, I'm not advocating you to follow my lead. I'm not saying this is the best method of parenting. It's probably the worst. You don't want to instill fear in your kids. But sometimes you just have to do what you need to do to get things done. It's hard being a parent of two young ones. And so I'm not proud of what I was doing to him, but he was learning an important lesson. And that lesson was that his choices and decisions are his but he needs to be accountable for the choices and decisions he, make, he makes. There are consequences to the choices that he makes. And it's the same for us as Christians. We have the freedom to make choices and decisions for ourselves in this life. But we also are accountable for those choices. Jesus has told us that he will come back one day. And when he does, we will have to take account for how we live in the present And yet so many of us, I think we simply reduce our faith to our beliefs. We believe in Jesus. We believe in the cross. We believe in the resurrection. We believe in what Jesus has done for us in defeating sin and death. But it isn't just about what we believe. What he says is that we will be accountable for how we put our faith and belief into action. Belief is just the starting point of our faith. But it's in choosing to live faithfully for Jesus that we see real evidence of that faith. It is faithfulness that God desires from you and me. Today, we're going to take a look at what it means to live faithfully as we await Jesus' return. And if you have your Bibles with you, uh, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to read verses 14 through 30. So that is Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Verse 14, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. 
See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In this parable, we are told that a master is going on a journey and entrusts his wealth to three servants. After some time, the master returns to settle accounts with each servant. He holds each servant accountable for the choices they made while he was away. But the criteria by which they were judged and evaluated is not what you would think. If we were to be evaluated today for our work, the criteria by which we would be judged would be on things like success or production and results. But God cares about only one thing, and that one thing is faithfulness. The servants were judged and evaluated because of their faithfulness. Reading the passage, you might think that the servants were judged by their success because the two servants who earned a profit were rewarded and found the master's approval. While the one who earned nothing was rejected. But when we look at the master's response to the servants, it is about faithfulness. The amount that the servants were given was a great deal of money. Scholars say that a talent equates to about 50 or 20 years of a day laborer's wage. Other scholars say that the equivalent of one talent is $600,000 in today's currency. These are big sums of money, but to the master, they were nothing. He even goes on to describe the talent as a small amount. When he tells the faithful servants, you have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. It wasn't about the money. It wasn't about the results What the master was focusing on was how each servant used the resources that they had been given. And we find out that the two servants, that two of the servants acted faithfully while one servant acted fearfully. The one servant who had been given five bags of gold gained five more. And the master commends him by calling him good and faithful. The second servant who had been given two bags also gained two more. And like the first, the master is pleased, and once again, he responds, well done, good and faithful servant. Both servants receive the same words, even though they gain different amounts, because both of them acted out of faith. But it's with the third servant that we see a different response. The third servant who was given one bag of gold did not use his resources to profit the master. Instead, He buries it into the ground so that he would not lose it. The third servant who buried the master's property acted out of fear. He was afraid of losing the money. He was afraid that a thief would come at night and take it. But most of all, he was afraid of the master. In justifying his actions, the third servant says in verse 24, Master, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. He saw the master as a hard man. He believed that the master was corrupt and unethical, taking what he did not work for. And because of this, he acted out of fear. Do you find yourself living by faith or by fear? The answer hinges on a key question, and that question is, who is God to you? Is God someone to be feared, or is he someone to be revered? How you answer this question will determine how you live in the present. In the Bible, we are told that we are to fear God, but the word for fear in those instances is better translated or understood as revere. This reverence of God is a holy fear 
that leads us not to hide from him, but one that beckons us closer to him. If we were to know how amazing, how loving, how gracious God is, it would beckon us closer to him. The lens by which we experience God is impacted by how we view him. If we see God as this angry God, God is always going to get... God is always out there to get us. And when we look at our circumstances and situations, we see that God is the one who's inflicting the pain on us. But if God is a loving God, we know that even in those situations, even in our hardships, it's God who is carrying us through it. It's God who's giving us the strength to endure. If God is a killjoy and we see him as the one who's trying to kill the joy in our lives, then yes, we see his commandments as oppressive instead of liberating and giving us the freedom to live the abundant life that he has for us. Our view of God will inform our experience of God. And having a wrong attitude about God results in an excuse for disobedience. A misconception of who God is will lead us to alienation, distrust, and ultimately unfaithfulness towards God. How many of you are afraid that God's going to ruin your life if you give yourself, your whole self to him? That notion is founded in this inaccurate view of God. If God is good, loving, and faithful, then how can we believe anything else other than that God wants the best for us? And this is why we need to separate the truth from lies. We need to be able to see God for who he truly is. In this passage, the master represents God, and it would be easy for us to think that the passage is saying that God is evil, or that he's corrupt, or that he's wicked. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus would never call the Father corrupt or evil. This description of the master is only a view that the third servant had. Neither of the other two servants describes the master in this way. And when we look at the passage the entire passage, nothing would indicate that the master was evil at all. In fact, what we see is a good master. The master puts a lot of faith in his servants, entrusting him, entrusting them with his wealth. He wasn't obligated to give them anything, but he wants them to partner with him in what he's doing. To those who are faithful, he wants to reward with more. He wants to be generous. He also wants his servants to experience his joy. Ultimately, he wants them to feel joy. Everything points to this master being good. And I would suggest that the unfaithful servant didn't know the master very well. When we have a right relationship with God and know his true character and nature, then we will be able to operate out of faith rather than fear. And this living by faith that we're talking about isn't just obedience. I think oftentimes we associate faithfulness with obedience. And there is some truth to that. To be faithful is to obey, but there's so much more to being faithful. Right? Notice in the passage that the master does not give the servants any instructions. He simply leaves them with his resources, and they are to use it as they see fit. Their faithfulness was not based on how well they followed instructions because there were no instructions. They were asked to use their discernment and wisdom and take the initiative to act in a manner that would please him. Faithfulness is about pleasing God. It's about knowing his heart and wanting to honor him. So what does faithfulness look like as we await Jesus' return? What does faithfulness look like as we await Jesus' return? First, we are faithful when we are good stewards of his gifts and resources. We are, good, we are faithful when we are good stewards of our gifts and resources. We are called to be stewards of the gifts that God has given to us. Look at what it says in verse 15. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The master in the parable gives his servants bags of gold. 
The master is the owner of the gold, and he entrusts his servants with what is his. In the same way, God is the owner of everything. Everything that we have is a gift from him. Being a good steward begins with understanding that everything is God's. And although we would like to believe that everything that we have has been gained through the work of our own hands, God is the one who's blessed us with it. God is able to give and take away at any moment. Being a good steward is about recognizing God's provision in our lives and using the resources he's given to us, not for our own gain, but for God's gain, for his purposes. The two faithful servants in the parable used what was given to them to earn more for their master. They didn't seek their own gain. They weren't scheming on how they can make their lives easier with what they had been given. They were single-minded and focused on one thing. How can I serve my master? Are you using God's resources for God's gain or for your own? Are you busy building up your own kingdom or are you busy building up God's kingdom? If you want to know the answer to that question, just take a look at how you use your resources. Right? How are you spending your time? How are you using your influence? How are you using your money? One of the topics that Jesus speaks about most in the Bible is money because he knows so many of us struggle with it. He knows that so many of us struggle loving money too much, even to the point where tithing and giving to the work of God becomes optional. But tithing is not an option for a disciple. It is a biblical mandate by God that we would give to support the things, the works of God in this world. Your tithe cannot be measured by the dollar value. Your tithe is about building the kingdom of God. When you give, you are partnering with God in the work that he's doing around the world. So many of us see tithing as giving money to the church, but what tithing is really about is people experiencing the love of God and becoming disciples of Jesus. And how could we not want to give knowing that our tithes go towards people knowing Christ? Right? Tithing and giving is rooted in stewardship. You are giving to God what is already his to build his kingdom. And the one thing that I've learned about giving to God is that you can never outgive God. Even in the past, we're told that those who are faithful with what has been given to them will be rewarded with more. And I'm not saying that God is going to reward you with more money, but I do believe it's biblical that God will bless you far more than we could ever bless him whether that's with finances, whether that's with relationships, whether that's with work. It doesn't, it, God's going to bless us far more than we could ever bless him. So let's be good stewards of our resources, but let's also be good stewards our, of our gifts and talents. In the passage, we're told that the servants were given a certain amount of gold according to their ability. The one with five talents was more gifted, while the one with one was less gifted. But regardless of how much, they were all gifted. They all had talents. They all had abilities. You all have so many gifts and talents, but what is keeping you from using them? Some of you aren't stewarding your gifts because maybe you're too busy coveting what other people have. Right? I'm sure there are certain gifts and talents that we all would like to have, but don't devalue how God has created you and the gifts that he's given to you. God created you in a specific way for a specific reason. You are gifted and talented, and God wants you to use those gifts and talents to bless others. So don't waste them. Having talent without using it is just potential. And untapped potential is just a wasted opportunity. Uh, one thing that I've learned about myself more recently is that I'm pretty handy. Like, I like to fix things. I like home renovation. Like, over the last few years, um, my love for HGTV. Do we have any people who love HGTV in here? Oh, nice. I got some people in the back. Like, I love HGTV. I love watching home improvement shows. And I think there's something biblical or even gospel-centered in that because it's like when you take something that is so broken, so battered, 
even ugly, and make it and restore it into something that is beautiful, right, that's the gospel message, right, that we were sinners, and yet God redeems us. God redeems our brokenness. And so for me, over the last few years, I think God's, like, lit this passion for carpentry and home renovation and woodworking in my life, even to the point where on my last sabbatical, Thankfully, this is before my kids, and my wife at that time was very gracious, right? But I took this intensive, one-month intensive long class in carpentry where I learned to, like, build homes and to renovate homes. And so when I think about it, this is a late-stage development in my life. I didn't know that I was good at fixing things. I didn't know I was handy, right? Nobody taught me how to do these things. But in the last few years, God has been really lighting up this passion and skill in my life, and I've been able to use it to actually try to build God's kingdom, right? At my church, I'm known as, like, the carpentry pastor, right? If there's a problem at your home, they'll call me or text me. They're like, Clay, can you come over? Can you check this out? And sometimes I have no idea what they're talking about, but other times I try to be as helpful, and I try to bless them as much as I can by trying to help them in reworking or fixing up their homes. But a project that I'm super excited for in the next few weeks is that I've been asked by the children's ministry to build a wooden cross for them. Right? Easter's coming up. It's around the corner. And they asked me to build this wooden cross for one of their activities. And that's got me super pumped and excited because I get to be a part of children loving, understanding and learning about the love and sacrifice of Jesus. That it was Jesus who died on the cross for them. This is just one way that God has been using me and using and developing talents and gifts in my life just to be able to bless his kingdom. It's never too late to discover your gifts and talents, but there will be a day when it's too late to actually use them. In the passage, we're told that the consequence of not putting our talents to work is that it will be taken away from us. The one talent that the third servant was given was wasted, and in the end, it was taken from him. But that's not the worst part. He didn't just lose his talent. He missed out on sharing in the master's joy. The real tragedy in the parable isn't that this third servant wasted his gifts. The real tragedy was that he missed out on experiencing the father, the master's joy. When we partner with God to build his kingdom, we experience deep joy knowing that what we do matters, that knowing that it's making a kingdom difference, knowing that it lasts for eternity. It is a joy that will last for all eternity. So don't let your gifts and talents go to waste. You've been given them for a reason, so live faithfully by stewarding your gifts and your resources. That's what it means to live faithfully as we await Jesus' return. The second thing, we are faithful when we are taking risks with purpose. Taking risks with purpose. God doesn't mind failure. I think we have an aversion to failure. We don't like taking risks. We don't want to look, be seen as a failure. But in playing it safe, we aren't being faithful to God. Look at verse 24 and 25. It says, Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. The servant's actions were driven by fear. He was afraid of the master because... In his eyes, he was unethical and harsh. But there's another reason for his fears. And that is due to his fear of failure. And we know that by the master's response. The master responds in verse 26. You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. The master's response isn't an admission of guilt. He is not admitting to be a, being an unethical and corrupt person. Looking at his response, we see that he leaves out a key word, and that word is hard. Because in fact, he is not a hard man. 
what the master is doing is using the servant's own words to tear down their servant's excuse. He's saying, if you truly believed what you are saying about me, then the least of what you would have done is to invest my money with bankers so that I would have some kind of profit. He is dissecting the servant's justification. The servant's actions were partially driven by his fear of failure. He didn't trust in his own ability, even though the master trusted in his ability. We need to stop being afraid of failing because it's okay to fail. If we fear failure, then we are making it too much about ourselves. And that may mean, it may be an indication of us having low self-esteem. I was at a conference one time where a psychologist was giving us, giving a talk about students and procrastination. And what she said was that at, oftentimes students will procrastinate because they fear failure. They fear failure. The reason they procrastinate is due to a certain sense of low self-esteem. Because they don't believe in their abilities fully, students will procrastinate so that they can have an excuse if things don't go well. So instead of trying their very best, instead of putting all their effort into getting an A, they would rather settle for a B or C because if they didn't get that A, it would be too much for them. But if they procrastinate, they can feel good about themselves about getting a B or C because they can rationalize it as saying, oh, I did my best with the very little time I had. And so a B or C, I did pretty good. They are settling for a worse grade because they fear failure. Why are we settling for lesser things when God calls us to greater things? You need to stop making it about yourself and let go of your fear of failure so that God can use you. Stop allowing your fears to dictate what God can do through you. God doesn't mind failure, but what he does mind is you not stepping out in faith. The things that God will call you to do will be risky at times. They will require faith, but you can be confident in taking those risks because it's not for nothing. When you take a risk for God, it's always with purpose. Risking failure for a worthy cause is always worth it. And there's no greater cause than to please God and to share in his joy. Sharing in his joy is never about the results, but it's about the heart. God doesn't care about the results as much as he does about your heart and your willingness to risk it all for him. How many of us would be willing to look like a fool for God? To do the will of God, to risk failure, and to experience being humbled isn't the worst thing in life. It is far worse to never step out in faith because of fear because then you will never experience the victories that come with trusting in God and taking those risks. Faithfulness, it requires us to take risks because the things that God calls us to are always God's size. But we can be sure that God is with us as we go through those things. And finally, we are faithful when we are putting our faith into practice. We are faithful when we are putting our faith into practice. In this parable, two servants are commended for their action, while one servant is rejected for their inaction. The servants, are being called, aren't, the servants aren't being called faithful for what they believe, but it's in putting their faith, their belief into action. The two faithful servants know what the master desires and acted accordingly. They didn't wait. They went immediately and put their talents, their, uh, their bags of gold to work immediately. Living faithfully and working to build God's kingdoms matters. It is evidence of our discipleship. The reality is that we will be judged and held accountable for the way that we live, and this parable serves as a warning and a test of our discipleship. It's not enough just to believe in Jesus. We have to put that belief into action because if we don't, then the reality may be that we may be going to hell. And I hate to say that. 
I hate to say that. But these aren't my words. These are Jesus' words. It's Jesus who, said, who speaks this parable. He says that the third servant is thrown out where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And this isn't about earning our way into heaven. I'm not talking about works-based faith. Salvation cannot be earned. But faith without action is meaningless. And that's what we're told in James 2. In the second chapter of James, it says, Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. We cannot earn our way into heaven. It is only by God's grace that we are saved. But effort does matter. I love what theologian and pastor Dallas Willard says about grace. He says, grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. Right? Grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. Effort is the outworking of our faith, and it shows that we are partnering with God in his mission on earth. What we do because of our beliefs is just as important as what we believe. Our faith is more than just showing up and listening to a sermon. It's more than just reading the Bible. It's more than just having a time of worship. These are all things that are important to our faith. But in the end, if we do nothing in building God's kingdom, then it's meaningless. I don't think Jesus would be very pleased if he came back today and just saw us meeting on a Sunday worshiping together, but doing nothing for the marginalized, the oppressed, and the lost. If our faith was only evident on Sunday morning, I think God would be disappointed because the purpose of the church has been to carry the gospel outside of these walls. We gather so that we can scatter, carrying the good news. The purpose of the church has always been about carrying the good news to those who need it, the lost, the broken, the marginalized, and the oppressed. If our faith isn't being put into practice, then we have to ask ourselves, do we really have faith? A few years ago, I found myself in the middle of some ministry, potentially ministry-destroying rumors. I was leading, I was, a, I was the youth group pastor at my church, and so I was leading this high school ministry at the time. And we were growing. We were being faithful to God's call in our life, in, our, in the ministry, right? We were a place that was for the church and the unchurched to find community. Like, the ministry was thriving. People within the church, kids who had grown up in the church were part of our ministry, but then we had this other side where the people in the community, kids of the community were coming to the church, kids who had never come to church before, The ministry was thriving, but then all of a sudden there were rumors that kids were being sexually active on church grounds. And so when I first heard it, I was shocked. I was like, there's no way that this could be possible. But then my shock turned into shame. And I just felt like a failure. I felt like I had failed as a leader. I felt like I failed as a pastor because how could this be happening under my watch? It was a really dark time in my life where I just started to question everything. I would be on my hands and knees just crying, God, why? Why is this happening? Like, I thought this is what you wanted. I thought you wanted this thriving ministry. So why is it happening right now? It was a time where I just started to question being a pastor. I had some serious thoughts about just quitting ministry because in myself, I saw all my shortcomings. And I felt like I didn't deserve to be a pastor. I was scared of how this was going to ruin the church. I was scared of how this was hurting people. I thought maybe this ministry, the high school ministry, the youth group ministry, would be better off in somebody else's hands. But through the wise counsel of friends and mentors, I was reminded of my calling. And for a while, that's all I had to cling to. I had to remember that God called me for this purpose. I had to remember that God had gifted me and given me a passion and love for students. And so for a while, that's all I clung to. 
And I just had to trust that things would get better. And to be honest, things didn't get better for a while. Things eventually did get better, but it took a long time. It didn't happen immediately. It wasn't like God resolved the problems overnight. We sought the counsel of our denomination, and we had the matter investigated and looked into. And thankfully, I can say they were just rumors. But the damage was already done. People left the church. The ministry struggled. It was a hard time in our church's life. But through it all, God was being faithful. He was being faithful to our ministry. He was being faithful even in my own life. Looking back, I am so glad that I didn't quit ministry. I'm so glad that I didn't allow my fear and experience of failure to keep me from continuing in ministry, using my gifts and taking risks for God. Because if I had done so, I would have missed out on something so beautiful. I would have missed out on the restoration of the youth ministry because God took it from a place of humble beginnings to something that's never been before. In our youth ministry, we have over 100 students. And it took God reworking it, God reshaping it, God really working in that ministry to really revive it from dying. And to think, I would have missed in the redemption of all of that if I had quit. When we choose to be faithful by being good stewards, by taking risks with purpose, and by putting our faith into practice, we experience God's faithfulness in our lives. Jesus is clear about what the future holds. He will come back one day, and we will have to take an account for how we live in the present. What he desires is faith over fear. So don't let your fears keep you from living faithfully for him. My hope and my prayer for all of us today is that when Jesus returns, we would hear him say the very words, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servants. God is not asking you to be perfect. God is not asking you to have all the answers. All God desires from each of us is that we would be faithful. So can we be faithful as we await his return today? Will you bow your heads with me? God, it's hard to hear these words sometimes. I think oftentimes in, your, in the Bible, God, it's very simple what you are saying to us, but it's really hard to live them out at times. And so I pray, Father, that these words that we've read today would not only be a challenge to us, but would also be encouragement. May we be challenged to really live faithfully for you, that we would live out our calls to be your disciples, that we would live out our call to go to the ends of the world, ends of the earth, and to share the good news to everyone. God, you didn't come to condemn. And so my prayer and hope, God, that this is not condemnation, but this is a jolt for us to really live faithfully for you and to be encouraged because we know, Father, that the greatest joy is to experience your joy. And that's something that you've promised to us, God, as we partner with you, God, in what you are doing in this world. And so I pray, God, that you would bless this church. I pray, God, that you would bless Riverside Community Church. I pray that you would bless my brothers and sisters, that you would give them the boldness and the courage to say yes, God, to the things that you're calling them to. I pray, Father, that you would use this church, that you would use your people to do mighty things that they would have visions and dreams, Father, greater than they could even understand or imagine, but that they would be your dreams and your visions for not only this church, but for this community that they find themselves in. So I thank you, God, for the things that you are teaching us. I thank you, God, for the ways that you are speaking to us, even in this moment. I just pray, Father, that you would continue to minister to us. 
may you continue to minister to us. So God, may we live faithfully for you. May we not allow our fears, our worries, our busyness to get in the way of living faithfully for you. Thank you, God, for being a God that goes with us, a God who is always present with us, a God who never leaves us. God, you have promised that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And that's your promise to us. And so may we go with boldness and courage, knowing, Father, that no matter what it is you're calling us to do, that you're going to be with us every, every step of the way. Pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us as we are. You don't ask for perfection from us. You don't ask us to be presentably before you. All you ask of us, all you desire from us is to be faithful. So I pray over my brothers and sisters right now. Give us the courage, the boldness to be faithful. May this word be a challenge, but yes, also an encouragement of hope, God. Hope of abundant life that you have and desire for us. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless. Have a great Sunday.